we go. And welcome now to those of you joining us on YouTube. On the TCF housekeeping side of things, thank you to Itasca Bank for sponsoring this webinar. Sponsors like Itasca Bank helps to keep these webinars free for everybody. Contact us if you know of a business who might be interested in sponsoring these webinars or if you are interested in sponsoring them through your company. But you can also help us to keep these free. After the webinar at the very end, when you close out, you're gonna be taken to a page with a bunch of resources of things you may be interested in, such as our native plant guide, rain barrel information, and so much more, including our virtual tip jar. If you're watching this on YouTube and you're interested in this information, send me an email and we would be more than happy to get you that link. If you are enjoying these webinars, I do encourage you to donate to help the Conservation Foundation continue to do all of the awesome stuff that we do because we do so much more than webinars. You can also check the box when you uh, donate to become a member and then you can enjoy a wide variety of members only stuff such as this Friday we're doing a members only hike. I will be leading a hike at Lake Renwick in Plainfield. So our members get lots of cool perks and benefits like our free members only hikes. All right, upcoming webinars. As we mentioned, we've been doing these for over a year now and we're gonna keep doing them as long as you all keep attending. So um, next week, we're gonna be joined by uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service, who's gonna be talking about the rich natural history of Northeast Illinois, endangered and threatened species here in the area. I'm really looking forward to that one. That one should be really cool. And on June 16th, the following week, we will be joined by our friends at NCAP to talk about native plants and soil health. So another one not to miss. Our NCAP friends are so knowledgeable and I can't wait to hear what they have to say as well. All right, without further ado now, I am going to turn it over to our friend, Allison, and we're gonna talk about green exercise today. And maybe this will be the inspiration that I need to get back on the horse with uh, with my exercise routine. So well, thank you so much, Jamie, for having me. And thank you to the Conservation Foundation as well. So uh, can I go ahead and start sharing my screen? Go All right. right ahead. So we'll get this PowerPoint um, pulled up here. All right. And um, Jamie, I'm just going to ask that you give me a warning when we're about five or 10 minutes to two. Um, but I will keep track of time as well. But just in case I miss that. Thanks, Jamie. Will do. Great, thank you. All right, so let's get started chatting about, oops, and let me go back to this picture. So some of these pictures are actually from the Conservation Foundation and the Resiliency Institute's um, food garden that is at their McDonald farm location. And this picture is one of them. This is their bridge um, in that garden. So I will try to uh, recognize those and give them a shout out too. So I'm Allison, I'm a physical therapist. I have a doctorate in physical therapy and I'm an owner of a small business called Ignite Wellbeing. I'm also a faculty member at the Resiliency Institute um, and they often partner with and utilize some of the space at the Conservation Foundation. Um, and then I'm a part-time instructor of graduate students for a, a doctorate of physical therapy program for a um, university in the South. And um, I mentioned that because I teach this content for those graduate students. I might even use the recording from this webinar for them as well for the future. Um, but I teach them about fitness and wellness within the scope of practice of physical therapy. And the orientation I have for my business is touching on the physical, social, spiritual, and sexual well-being for individuals and societal health. And I also lift some of my professional offerings as well. And these include group fitness opportunities as well as outdoor exercise. All right, so for the presentation today, I want to chat about briefly the health of Americans and kind of the trajectory that we're on, um, the current exercise recommendations and whether or not Americans are meeting them. I'm going to take a step back and discuss nature therapy in general from a big umbrella type perspective and then where green exercise fits into that and how green exercise actually works and why it's important. And then some specific applications, whether that's at the individual level or at the community slash work level, and even some advocacy or social, social justice considerations that um, we should consider when discussing green exercise. All right, so 
I'm going to start by discussing the health of Americans. So essentially, um, we are becoming a more urban species. I believe it's estimated that 65% of the worldwide population by 2030, which is coming around the corner, will be um, urban individuals. Um, and we're facing, because of urbanization, we're facing some unique stresses for our evolutionary history. So we have what's called techno stress, or we're exposed to techno stress, and I'll explain what that means in a moment. And it's thought that because of this urbanization and these new forms of stresses, that these are contributing to things like non-communicable disease and um, mental health issues. All right, so I'll talk about that a little bit more here in a moment. So um, taking a step back, well, what does health even mean? So oftentimes when we consider health, we think in terms of disease, whether a disease is present or absent. But really, um, according at least to the World Health Organization, it's much more than that. It includes well-being and wellness. So it's not just the absence of disease, but it's physical, mental, social well-being, your personal and social resources. So it's beyond just the singular individual to consider their community as well. And so we're thinking in terms of broadly, in terms of what health actually means and how it can be applied uh, in particular for our purposes with green exercise in mind. And then worldwide, as well as for the U.S. in particular, the leading cause of death and disability here is non-communicable disease. And so that includes things like hypertension, stroke, type 2 diabetes, uh, ischemic heart disease, things of that nature. And a lot of these non-communicable diseases, um, they can be prevented or at least um, moderated to an extent extent with lifestyle choices. So things like reducing alcohol consumption or smoking cessation, exercise and diet, those are the four big ones that really help prevent these non-communicable diseases. And then there's also social determinants that have to be considered with non-communicable disease too. So things like poverty, racism, transportation, job security are all contributors, big picture beyond the individual for possible disease um, components here. And I will mention later on that um, green space is actually considered a social determinant of health by some individuals, uh, the exposure to green space. Now, what's really interesting is that, you know, I mentioned physical activity can help prevent non-communicable disease, but sedentary lifestyle is a separate risk factor for non-communicable disease. So when you think in terms of smoking and physical activity, we also have to think of how many hours a day are individuals sedentary, and that relates back to that urbanization and that techno stress. We're sitting more, we're exposed to more technologies, we're having to adapt to these more, we're working eight to 12 hour days, sometimes more for individuals. We're moving a whole lot less. Um, there was a quote from my earlier research um, when I did a similar presentation for physical therapists about this, that there has never been a time in history when we've been able to move so far without very, you know, limited physical investment, you know, taking cars and trains, but really just sitting. So con considering how sedentary lifestyle is a contributor to non-communicable disease is important here. And then last but not least um, to consider is mental health, because this is a big part of what makes green exercise so unique, um, is that mental health is a significant contributor to the health of Americans, and it's getting worse. It's getting worse for Americans and getting worse worldwide. And it's thought in part, again, because of that techno stress and that urbanization, that reduced exposure to green space and um, even reduced family and, and things like that that we're, that we're dealing with um, currently. And it's said that there is no health without mental health. And so oftentimes when people think of health care issues, they think of physical issues, but it's mental health as well. And then some scientists even consider Consider mental health to be a non-communicable disease because there's a complex bi-directional relationship between the two that mental health will play into these non-communicable diseases as well. All right, so I set the tone for basically the health of America. Um, it's, it's not great, and um, I discussed ways and reasons why and then ways to prevent that. So through exercise, diet, um, tobacco cessation, um, alcohol, limiting alcohol consumption. Um, and then specifically as a physical therapist, my lens is often through physical activity. And with the tone of this lecture being green exercise, we're gonna focus on that. So the current recommendations for Americans for physical activity were actually established in 2008. And they are that 
that um, adult Americans exercise at a moderate to vigorous level for up to 150 minutes per week. And then you have two days or more of strength training um, in addition to those 150 minutes of aerobic activity. Older adults have some specific recommendations. Uh, they are it's suggested that they perform balance activities about three times a week. And then children ages up to 18, their recommendations are 60 minutes or so daily of moderate to vigorous physical activity. Um, and so I wanna mention too, before I lose track of this as well, that um, moderate physical activity, how would you even figure out what that means? So. Um, if zero, if you use a scale from zero to 10 and zero is sitting on the couch doing nothing and 10 is full out, all you can do basically going to drop down from it and, and um, fatigue or fail out of that activity. Uh, a moderate level activity is five to six out of 10, if you were to rate that. So rate of perceived exertion, RPE scale, that five to six out of 10. And then the um, vigorous activity is up to about eight, maybe even gain into a nine out of 10 would be a vigorous activity. So just to kind of put that into perspective for you. So Americans are not meeting these recommendations and there are many thoughts as to why. Um, we're slowly incrementally increasing the number of Americans exercising, but I believe it's only 23% um, or so uh, of adult Americans and um, American adolescents that meet these recommendations. So we still have um, a significant way to go. More people are able to meet those aerobic recommendations and the strength training. Um, there are age differences, race differences um, and it's thought that you know men and um, white men in particular are able to meet those exercise recommendations better than other groups um, and so there are a lot of educational opportunities and healthcare task force that are working to increasing uh, the number of Americans that are exercising and narrowing those differences between gender race socioeconomic status and that kind of thing um, but barriers, common barriers are lack of time, uh, financial reasons, child care, things like that. So a lot of the time, those that work in public health or physical therapy, if we're working one-on-one -on -one with clients or with bigger groups, we try to remove those barriers and make exercise more accessible. So it's kind of beyond the educational idea, um, as well as helping facilitate this exercise by removing barriers that might be preventing people from meeting those recommendations. All right, so I mentioned that we would take a step back from the um, health and from green exercise to consider nature therapy in particular. So nature therapy is essentially a set of practices that allows for the prevention of disease. But in addition to the prevention of disease, it can be a complementary or alternative health resource. So um, people can utilize it for a variety of things, whether that's for reducing stress, improving immune system, um, you know, all, all kinds of stuff. So we'll talk about that a little bit more on the next slide here. Um, and let's see, so nature therapy, the benefits of nature therapy are things like reduced disease, morbidity and mortality. So morbidity is the level of sickness essentially from a disease and mortality is deaths for those that aren't familiar with those terms. Um, improved stress, immune system changes. So NK is natural killer cells and those cells in particular help with things like cancer prevention. Um, reduced pain perception. So exposure to green space or nature therapy can actually um, help individuals with chronic pain perceive less pain. Nature therapy in some studies show improved mood and mental health. Um, cardiovascular changes. And again, those NCD issues, those non-communicable diseases, one of the big ones was cardiovascular disease. And so that's pretty significant. Uh, improving cognition and concentration, even creativity, social engagement and spiritual well-being or awe. Um, and oftentimes that when people express things like awe, which is a form of spiritual well-being, it's in regards to natural elements um, or the, the natural world. So considering that as well. And there's a long history of utilizing nature therapy. Um, so 
the Greeks would oftentimes establish healing areas outside and their, their god of medicine, their temples to the god of medicine were outside and they utilized those nature elements. Monasteries that were oftentimes the site of hospitals, they would include gardens in their hospitals. Um, in the late 1800s, there were physicians that were recognizing um, within mental health institutions, men that languished in their rooms actually performed worse or had worse outcomes and men that were allowed to go outside and chop wood and use their body and be out in nature, they had better outcomes um, after their stays. So there's a long history of utilizing nature. And then I should mention too, even um, Frederick Law Olmsted, who was in charge of certain parks like Central Park in New York, he was an architect and, and he promoted parks for social restoration and social um, cohesion and reduction in crime. So there's a long history here and using nature therapy for medicinal reasons as well as social reasons. But how does it even work? Um, science doesn't necessarily know and they've there have been several studies. So uh, the, some scientists have looked at sounds, perhaps it's listening to the nature sounds when you're outside. Um, others have looked at lack of sounds, so lack of man-made sounds is possibly um, lending itself to these restorative effects from nature therapy. Maybe it's a percent green coverage, maybe it's a percent blue coverage or blue being water, so lakes or rivers, streams, that kind of thing. The smells, so the phytoncides from the um, pines and this wood essential oils that you might be getting exposed to while you're outside. Um, it could possibly be the reduced pollution that you're experiencing, um, in particular after, you know, having a certain level of barrier from trees and preventing that exposure to pollution when you're out in certain nature areas that that may be beneficial for your health. It could be visually exposing yourself to these fractals or those branching patterns within nature, whether that's, um, you know, within plants. And you can kind of see that with some of the, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but some of the uh, branching patterns of plants that would be considered fractals, those symmetric and repeating patterns, waves are fractals, snowflakes are fractals, and that's supposed to be relaxing to um, humans. Could be exposure to the soil micro organisms, could be spatial frequency. So that's basically referring to the complexity of the environment and the shades and tonality and things like that. So um, it could be something about the elements that are benefiting us as humans while we're out in nature. It could be different ways that we process the information for stress management. So there are top down and bottom up approaches for those that might be interested. So some suggest that it's you know, exposure to nature allows for just a mental relaxation and that mental relaxation will then allow for physiological effects to happen. And those physiological effects would include those things like the cellular changes at the immune system, those natural killer cells, for instance. Others say that um, being out in nature allows for a cellular and emotional attunement to the nature settings, which then trickles upward. So a bottom up approach causes relaxation with the exposure to nature. So it could be top down, it could be bottom up, it could be both. It could also be our evolutionary history. So um, for 99.99% of the time that we have been around as humans, we have been outside. And so this urbanization and this pattern, we are out of our element that we've evolved to be in. So some suggest that that is why we are so attuned to nature and we get so many benefits from nature. And then others like E.O. Wilson um, suggest biophilia, that we just have this natural natural affinity for, for being outside and that that is the benefit. And personally, I think it's probably a combination of everything and that sometimes, um, you know, the, the magic is in the mystery too and the not knowing. Um, so anyway, a little bit more about green exercise. So just from the past few slides, we understand that nature is therapeutic, but exercise can be enhanced by actually exercising out of doors. So you, the exercise outside can be more challenging by dealing with different terrains or different textures or whatever um, might be imposed depending on the activity that you're doing. It's more complex for similar reasons. It's more varied. So you might start and stop more. You might work harder and we'll talk about that with that intensity level. And then it's often social. So oftentimes we go with a group or our families when we're exercising outside. 
but what does green exercise actually mean? Um, to me personally, and even professionally, I'm not a researcher, so I have a more broad definition. Um, I just consider it being physically active in a natural environment. Some um, researchers are very specific in their definition that it has to be, you know, green exercise. You have to be going outside and actually walking or running and having that intention to exercise. Some researchers are more broad and recognize that things like um, playing games outside even by children, even though the intent isn't necessarily exercise, you're outside, you're being active, so you're getting those benefits of green exercise and green exposure. Um, what is interesting is that a lot of the research out there is on green exercise, and I will give you a resource at the end of this deck um, in terms of where you can search for more information, but you can also plug in terms in regards to blue exercise and even brown exercise. So I, even though I'm referring to green exercise in general, and that is oftentimes in regards to um, percent forest cover or grass exposure, so the color green, but blue exercise is unique in that it considers water exercise. And oftentimes, again, with researchers being some more specific than others, um, they will often specify that this has to be not a man-made um, lake or, or pool that has to be a naturally occurring water source. And then brown exercise is desert. Um, and they found benefits from both. And so brown exercise is a little more limited in the research, but blue exercise is more commonly um, examined in the UK because, you know, that's an island and they have a lot of coastal and waterway areas. And so um, that those populations are being exposed to water a bit more and they find benefits uh, from blue exercise as well. Um, and I can speak to that a little more in a bit. So the idea of green exercise is just combining the benefits of exercise with the benefits of nature. So we talked a little bit about utilizing exercise to prevent things like non-communicable disease. It can also improve mental health, uh, prevent various forms of cancer, um, regulate blood sugars and um, fats like cholesterol and things like that. So uh, lots of health benefits there. And then obviously nature has health benefits or exposure to nature. So with green exercise, you're getting the benefit of both. You're essentially double dipping there. All right, so some of the findings and I've got on the next few slides, some more specifics here. So with green exercise, there are physical health benefits, mental health benefits. There are changes in motivation, training, and enjoyment that I want to chat about. And then there are benefits across populations. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we're going to chat about all of these here. So in terms of um, physical health, essentially the benefits of exercising in these outdoor spaces are things like increased duration, increased intensity, and lowering of that RPE. So if you remember early on, I mentioned what RPE is. That's that rate of perceived exertion. And so that's where you know, you're know you um, basically estimating how hard you're working from zero to 10. Again, that moderate level is around five or six, and um, vigorous or higher intensity is seven, eight, nine. Um, and so when you exercise outside, they've noticed that for a lot of individuals, you're more likely to exercise longer, which is important because um, as Americans, we're not meeting that minimum of 150 minutes of aerobic activity a week. You're going to exercise harder, that increased intensity, which can be important in particular for kids, and we'll chat about that in a moment. Um, and then there's that lowering of the RPE. And that's interesting because that can be relevant for people like athletes. So you might be able to dupe essentially athletes into working out harder and longer for their training or their pregame season um, by exercising outside. So that's kind of fun. Um, and there, there are a couple of scientists looking at why this occurs. So why are people exercising longer at harder intensities, but actually perceiving themselves as not working that hard? And it's thought that, um, remember I mentioned there are different ways that being in nature can allow for a stress reduction response. And one was the uh, top-down approach where being in tune with nature and visualizing nature, you kind of allow your attention to relax. Um, it's attention restoration theory is what that's called. And so by allowing your attention to relax and kind of divert your attention to nature, now you're not paying attention to how hard it is that you're exercising or how uncomfortable or how sweaty you are. And oh my God, how much longer do I have to do this? You're now paying attention to all that's going on around you and actually enjoying the scenery. So that's how they think this uh, impact is actually happening. 
Um, so I want to mention too that green exercise can improve sleep and it can actually um, do this for uh, the heart as well. So oftentimes um, we'll have some heart rate variability uh, even during our sleeping hours and heart rate variability is indicative of cardiovascular health. And so a lot of the time when people have examined green exercise in the past, they'll look at heart rate parameters right after the bout of exercise and they won't look at throughout the day or even overnight or into the next day. And that's what they found is that even overnight that these cardiovascular parameters were maintained during sleep and that um, individuals actually slept better after bouts of green exercise. And for children uh, with green exercise and playing outside in nature, they have a greater diversity of play as opposed to what they might be exposed to during um, a sporting event or with a certain piece of playground equipment. They have an increased diversity of play in green spaces and nature spaces. And there's a narrowing of a play gap. And so um, boys may play longer and harder than girls um, just because of it's thought socialization, not necessarily biological differences there. But these nature spaces can actually narrow that play gap and catch girls up to some of the physical activity that boys are experiencing too. And then if you remember, children in particular need that moderate to vigorous activity. So adults only need moderate activity for about 150 minutes a week, um, but children need a lot more. They need a 60 minutes a day of moderate to vigorous activity. So they need to be working harder and longer than adults. And um, similar to the adults with the increased intensity, they saw, saw that with children as well. So they're more able to get the vigorous activity outside in nature as opposed to a gym class or um, a sporting event or something like that where there's a lot of stop and go or waiting for your teammates or waiting for instruction um, that they are actually to play harder longer when they're outside. So some of the mental health benefits from green exercise include things like improved mood self-esteem. And what's unique about self-esteem is that um, researchers found that when individuals were exercising on a treadmill and even exposed them to nature visuals on the treadmill, whether that was pictures or TV, that they even had improvements in self-esteem between the controls who were just exercising without exposure to nature. So even this more two-dimensional exposure to nature can boost self-esteem, which is kind of wild for, for individuals. Um, mental health benefits also included enjoyment, attention, I may come back to these with asterisks in a moment, improved cognition um, and job performance, and then a reduction in stress, which I've mentioned before in terms of the stress management ideas and how that actually occurs for people out in nature, uh, reduced anger, depression, and confusion. So a lot of mental health benefits. Now, enjoyment might be unique to um, someone's personality. And so if you enjoy being in the outdoors, you might enjoy green exercise more than someone with a personality that doesn't like being outside. So that's an important uh, point to consider is that this this is personality based and researchers find those personality based differences as well. There might be some seasonal differences in this too. So some people might enjoy being outside during warmer weather. Some may enjoy winter sports, um, but notice, noting that there are climate differences or seasonal differences in that too. And enjoyment is also important because we are trying to get people to exercise more. And here is a potential modality or way of getting people out, um, out and about and moving in a way that they actually enjoy and um, exercise is so significant to health that 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 may be a pivotal factor for people is find uh, finding a hook finding a way to get them to do it by utilizing something that they enjoy like green exercise um, attention is also interesting so Researchers have looked at modes of exercise when outside. So an example was a study looking at people that walked for 50 minutes, five zero minutes versus people outside playing golf. And um, I am not a golfer, but reading this study um, and just my personal understanding of it. So a golf requires a lot of attention. And so you're focused on what you're actually doing for that sport versus walking doesn't require much attention. It's repetitive, almost meditative. Um, and they found that golfers actually didn't enjoy natural elements as much because they viewed them as distractions. So things like wind or leaf litter or what have you, all these natural elements 
movements that might in, with some modes of exercise be enjoyable for other modes of exercise like golf are not because they can be um, a distraction from the attention that they're trying to cultivate for their particular sport. So that's something to keep in mind too, whether you utilize this information personally or professionally is that um, it, it may differ depending on the mode or the modality of exercise, the mode of exercise exercise they're doing outside. And then what's also interesting is that they found benefits across populations. So across children, across adolescents, across adults, across disaffected youth or troubled youth, adults with dementia. There's, um, I think it was out of the UK, Dementia Adventures, where they take groups of adults with dementia outside um, and Alzheimer's in particular to help them with, with their disease process and their quality of life. Older adults, people with lower socioeconomic status, that's SES, socioeconomic status, and people with um, physical or mental ill health, such as PTSD. So a wide variety of people can benefit from um, exposure to green exercise. And then what's also interesting is that it shows benefits across time. And so I gave you a historical context, essentially, early on in the PowerPoint that um, people have recognized the healing potential of nature throughout history, you know, and that's we utilize natural substances for healing before pharmaceuticals even. And so we've been working with nature for our health for a long time, but even recently in current situation with COVID, um, exercise habits had to change because gyms were shut down. And so if you were going to maintain exercise and didn't have the luxury of a home gym, you were likely going to have to do it outside. Um, and so exercising outside became a safer alternative for people to remain physically active during COVID. And that um, studies are now showing that those that had established physical movement patterns and exercise patterns were able to stay healthier during COVID or have were less likely to have those worse outcomes just by having that, I don't know if you'd want to say a higher state of health or just being um, more physically primed, essentially. Um, so nature can potentially see us through the vicissitudes or the, the changes in, in history and the changes in what's going on. So it's always that safer alternative and that um, option that's always there if you need it to exercise outside. All right, so I mentioned that those those different um, conditions. So we've got benefits to the physical health, mental health across populations, even across time. And then there's that motivational factor. And so I think this is what is most interesting to me as a physical therapist when I try to work with people and actually do the interviewing, that motivational interviewing. Well, what do you enjoy? How do we get you exercising and that kind of thing? And so that's what they find is that exercising outside increases motivation and enjoyment of exercise for individuals, that they're more likely to participate in future bouts of exercise. Um, they report enjoying it more. And this is significant because within um, a year of gym memberships, for instance, 50 to 60% of those initial memberships lapse after a year. And so if you're able to find a way of getting people to exercise, to stay motiv motivated to exercise and continue to exercise in the future, that is significant. Um, and motivation, so if you think in terms of your own personal experience, um, there are two kinds. There's extrinsic and intrinsic. And oftentimes when we try to get people to exercise, it's through intrinsic or excuse me, extrinsic motivation. So things like um, workplace wellness setups where, you know, you um, exercise a certain number of days, you get a discount count on whatever, either your um, healthcare plan or you get some kind of lunch incentive or whatever, or gym membership, but they're oftentimes extrinsic rewards for exercising. But extrinsic motivation only lasts so long to actually keep people motivated and engaged in something. We really need to get it converted to intrinsic motivation. And so finding ways to do that for people is what's really going to help them keep up exercising, especially when the incentives of intrinsic rewards kind of start to lose their, their interest factor. Um, yeah, and I think there was something else I was going to say, but I forgot what that was. So I might have to come back to that. Um, but essentially here we're, we're getting people to exercise more, which can lead to greater public health. 
Oh, and then something I want to mention too is that if you are outside exercising um, and utilizing this as an alternative for the gym, like I said, whether that's COVID or just something that you were doing originally, you are developing relationship and connection with the land. And so um, that is something that I noticed here personally, as well as professionally with some of my clients is that you're starting to pay attention to what's going on around you. You wouldn't necessarily notice the seasonality and the landscape around you before when you're driving through it, but now that you're walking or running or in it once or twice a week, you're noticing changes, you're forming a relationship with it. And that's pretty significant. So um, we're not necessarily having to do those luxury vacations in Hawaii or Florida anymore. You're actually connecting to the land that's under your feet and has been under your feet too. Um, my kids and I, had a place where we would go and they would play, uh, speaking of moderate vig vigorous activity for them, um, uh, Wagan's Nature um, or Wagan Park, I think is the, the name, Wagan Riverfront Park. And it's got this little shell area. And with all the pool closures last year, um, I noticed more families kind of came and, and started visiting it and utilizing it. And I'm seeing that same pattern again. It used to be just be me and my family or maybe another family. Um, but now, you know, last year and now this year, I'm seeing that that little beach area is full. And so these people are now being forced to actually enjoy the land that they're on and be active on the land that they're on. And in some ways that might crowd out the rest of us. But overall, I think it's I think it's a great thing that they probably didn't realize that was there until they were forced to recognize that was there. Um, all right. So it's also significant about nature therapy and green exercise in particular is that this is considered an upstream approach to healthcare, And so um, nature therapy and green exercise can narrow some of these health inequalities and that's called equigenesis or equigenic environment and essentially what that means is that you are disrupting some of these um, disproportionate events that normally happen so people for instance with lower socioeconomic status might have a harder time um, reaching or um, obtaining some of the health care needs that they have or people with mental health issues or um, you know different racial groups too have have health inequalities but what they notice is that those individuals that um, maybe have more impairments for mental health or have uh, socioeconomic difficulties or challenges that they, because they have more to benefit from nature therapy, they often do. And so these groups tend to benefit more than maybe um, a middle-class white American would, for instance, from green exercise. So that is fascinating. It's essentially an equalizer here, um, which is a social justice uh, concern and um, consideration. So um, with the benefits from nature, with these narrowing of inequalities, with the exposure of green space, I mentioned earlier, potentially being a social determinant of health, um, and the highlighting and helping of social justice issues, and then the bonus of just physical activity and exercise, this is all considered an upstream approach to health. And um, that term, for those that aren't familiar, came out of the public health sector. And essentially, the idea is um, they often refer to it in a visual. So the idea is that if you come up to a stream and there are people drowning, for instance, and um, the idea is that we want to pull them out, we're going to pull out all these drowning people. So uh, a mirror would be in healthcare. you come up upon sick people and you want to help these individuals with medication or whatever and what you know you're just basically putting a band-aid on the problem the upstream approach is to go upstream and find out who is throwing all these people into the river or why are all these people getting sick and so this is moving beyond these individualistic ideas into considering preventative medicine at the population and social systems and um, nature therapy and, and green exercise is a one way of doing that all right, so, um, but how much nature do you need? So that's all well and good, nature therapy and green exercise, but how much do you actually need? And it's going to be individual specific and dependent on their environment as well as their exercise that they're doing too, and, um, and the intensity of that exercise. Some people recommend a minimum of five hours a month, um, but nature therapy, you tend to get benefits from um, as little as 10 to 15 minutes exposure in one viewing session. So you can do these shorter trips and shorter visits to nature, um, but different studies have looked at it from different time frames, whether that's 10 minute exposure, hour exposure, weekend long trips, week long trips, that kind 
kind of thing. And then this scale, I believe I gave you the reference um, over here by the bullet. So it just gives you an idea, excuse me, it just gives you an idea in terms of um, what you can do and where and how often to do that to garner some of these benefits from nature therapy. And then another study I recently came upon um, suggested anywhere from 120 to 300 minutes of nature exposure a week to get these benefits. And really um, to me, being realistic for some clients, that sounds like a lot, 300, minutes of nature exposure a week, that might be challenging. If you just tell people to um, start small and see how that goes, I think that you might have more buy-in from people and it feels more approachable too. All right, so some of the challenges to consider, whether that's implementing green exercise for yourself or if you work in a healthcare sector or um, you know land design and that kind of thing, will be things like accessibility. So um, and considering the populations that you're referring to with accessibility. So whether those are the older adults that might be utilizing these areas and um, those areas might feel less accessible to them when it's covered in ice and they're afraid of falls, which tend to be reported by older adults um, in the winter cities where they've done studies on green exercise, they will limit their use of spaces because they're afraid of falling on ice. And so um, making your spaces more accessible to the populations that are actually using them, or you can refer to accessibility in terms of people with disabilities. Um, you can think of in terms of location. So whether that's how far your um, trail entry or whatever the space is from a parking lot. So how um, that is an accessibility issue, but how far those are. You can think in terms of rural versus urban. And what's interesting is that even though there are benefits to green exercise across many different populations, um, and some studies have found that rural or and lower socioeconomic status individuals have benefits from green exercise and nature exposure that other studies have suggested when they've compared mortality rates to percent green cover in rural areas that some of these poor cities actually do worse. And that's significant because um, there's a lot of poverty worldwide. And uh, so even though that might not be applicable to us in the Naperville area, we're not that rural, but just considering context. So in some situations, um, green exercise and nature therapy in rural locations may not always be beneficial and additional studies are needed in terms of whether that was quality of the space um, or perceptions of safety or what have you or um, even public engagement because people might not even know it's there and then considerations of safety. And so um, again, whether that's similar to accessibility, whether that's ice and for certain populations or um, handrails that might be needed or benches to sit down on or lighting um, within reason uh, because of light pollution issues too. Um, and then we also talk about gender, sexuality and racial differences. So um, you can think in terms of Ahmaud Arbery and who was you know, shot while running. And so there are, um, differences that different people will experience depending on their own lived situation and honoring those those issues and needs. Um, and I mentioned that uh, towards the end of the deck as well. And then women often don't feel safe um, when exercising alone. And uh, so those considerations need to be taken into, into place, whether that's for you personally or professionally, just depending on your application of this information too. So how to implement, <clears throat> excuse me, green exercise. So um, personally, I would just, I, with my clients, I just tell them to start small and notice, just try it because um, green exercise is often considered low cost and accessible to an extent because uh, there's always nature spaces in theory around that you can utilize. So just try it and notice how it feels and notice the qualitative differences of exercise that you're experiencing. Um, you know, it's nice that research supports this stuff, but oftentimes we give away our power, you know, by not thinking of how we actually feel in our bodies. We're, you know, listening to what other people tell us how we should feel, but actually noticing how you respond to something because that can impact your intrinsic motivation and that desire to do future exercise because, wow, you're noticing that it really does help you with mood or stress or willingness to exercise again or enjoyment. Um, 
And then just giving yourself the opportunity to exercise outside, whether that's walking, running, swimming, as um, Jamie mentioned in her list of potential ideas at the beginning with that entry survey, um, or just being outside to view, view nature. So some of these nature therapy studies, even though it's not green exercise, a lot of the forest bathing stuff, it was you know 10 or 15 minutes of exposure in nature had benefits, health benefits for people. Um, so just try it. And uh, it's very low cost, low risk, and, and see how it goes for you um, and honoring those personal personal differences. Um, now, in terms of work or community level uh, implementation, you can consider things like green exercise breaks at work. So some of these studies have actually looked at walking meetings at work or um, walking during lunch and how that has worked for people. And it's often improved cognition as well as work enjoyment. So being mindful of that, you can ask for active meetings, walking meetings, active commuting, whether that's biking, walking, running to work requesting or normalizing activity breaks during work. So for instance, if you are on Zoom right now, I hope you're outside walking or on a treadmill with your cameras off and just normalizing that. People should be moving um, because sedentary, uh, sedentary behavior, again, is that separate risk factor for physical health. Um, you can consider joining or creating a community garden. So uh, this would be a community level implementation or work. So if you worked at, in a healthcare setting, community gardens are also great for um, different therapeutic effects, whether that's mental or physical therapies. Um, and then you can also look for community level groups. So whether that's a walking, running, hiking, biking group. I know um, Jamie was mentioning she's leading a hike. I believe she said this weekend. And when she signs back on here in a few moments, I'll ask her to mention that again for you all. Um, Meetup has these as well. So do the YMCAs. Different forest preserves do too. So considering your local community level options. All right, and then some advocacy considerations, and I have more on the next slide as well. So when you consider green exercise, oftentimes we're um, not thinking of blue exercise. I'm specifically referring to trail-based exercise here. You'll want to consider the trail system. So how connected is it, the type of terrain, um, and then a, a notification system. So. The notification system in particular, what I'm referring to is different than the safety one I have on the far right. The notification that I have in mind here would be something like the um, traffic notification system that your community might send you when, you know, there's been an accident off 59, please avoid this area. There can be notification systems like that are trails as well. Trail is flooded, please avoid this area. And making um, trails feel more uh, consistent and that way it will alert you to if there's an issue so you can avoid it, um, avoid it if you're commuting to work and that kind of thing. Because if it feels too variable or um, you know, not accessible, it makes it a little more challenging to bike to work. For example, if you're going to bike four or five miles, find out the trails flooded out and have to turn around, go home and get in your car, for instance. So I'm actually personally, I've emailed um, the Naperville Parks District about their trail system and I'm working with them on that right now. Um, type of terrain is an issue for some people because, you know, with balance challenges potentially um, and physical uh, difficulties, that may be a consideration and how connected. So um, if if you are biking with your children, for instance, or you have some other um, issue that you're dealing with, you know, how safe are you going to feel to jump off the bike trails for a while to cut through a neighborhood and bike or bike back on? So that's a concern for some individuals. So connected, well-maintained systems will um, be more appeasing to a lot of people. Rest stops and amenities are also important in a lot of studies. So um, when looking at green exercise and why or why not are people use it, utilizing certain facilities, um, having these benches to take breaks on, having restrooms or other amenities were helpful for individuals, particularly those older adults or with physical challenges. So those are important considerations depending on the populations that you're considering. And then safety. So this is a different from that notification system I mentioned earlier, but um, a lot of older adults in particular, they wanted to know that there would be a, some kind of call based system if they were to have a fall or a medical emergency that they can reach out to somebody. And um, if they feel isolated on a trail system that that limits the um, appeal of that system for them without having some kind of emergency call option. Um, so considering that as well, and then how safe the area is, whether that's perception or actuality, but that's a consideration as well in terms of why some people may or may not be using a nature space for exercise. 
some more advocacy ideas to consider, um, in particular for children to get them to be outside and active. There are groups called um, Hike It Baby, for instance. So that's great for um, parents with young children that get together at least pre-COVID, um, where you would hike with, with your young children. Free Forest School is another way to be outside and active. Navigators USA is um, similar, but it's a secular, similar to, but secular from um, Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts. Outward Bound and other programs that are good for youth as well as adults. Um, but children in particular are worth mentioning just because these are obviously our future caregivers of the environment. And it's suggested that by exposing them to nature, they start to form a relationship to nature. And that's not gonna happen over a single dose of nature. It's a longer term, slow to emerge, cultivated relationship. And these are our future caregivers. And so setting these children up to be out and about in nature will ensure that they're going to develop care, concern, and empathy for these nature spaces later on in their life and advocates as well. Um, we also want to be mindful of promoting diversity in the outdoors because a lot of people feel marginalized and uh, outdoors feels inaccessible to them, whether that's because of lack of representation or safety, which I mentioned as well in the lower box that creating safe space, um, but supporting different groups like Unlikely Hikers, Latino Outdoors, the Venture Out Project, Fat Girl Hiking, Outdoor Afro. And so these hopefully give you a couple ideas of groups to support and promote, whether that's on social media to follow them or actively engage with what they are doing, um, increasing representation for those with disability, BIPOC, GSRD, that's um, gender, sexuality, relationship, diversity. So that's a newer terminology for LGBTQA um, and happy Pride Month, by the way. And um, allowing for representation, community involvement, training and funding to create those safe spaces for marginalized people. And then engaging with um, marginalized people to asking for what they need and listening to those needs and experiences of diverse populations so that we can help um, utilize that equigenic space to help promote health and exercise while outside and in nature. And then a quote by Wendell Berry, the earth is all is what we all have in common. And then here are a list of resources. So a lot of the information that I used from the slide today and in the past um, for similar presentations uh, was from PubMed. And so I have that down here as well. So PubMed is the NIH's National Library of Medicine, and you can pull up their website, plug in, you know, some search terms like green exercise. And that came up with, I think it was like 3,900 articles. Um, and it will give you all sorts of research. Some of it is free and accessible to the public, some is not. And the stuff that is not is often 30 to $50 in articles. So with that in mind, you might choose more accessible um, soft literature that is research-based, such as Balanced and Barefoot, There's No Such Thing as Bad Weather, and then a couple books on um, forest bathing as well do a really nice job presenting the current science uh, behind some of these findings. And then there are local organizations that do this work too. Um, the Conservation Foundation, the Resiliency Institute, Morton Arboretum, different forest preserves of the, our local counties, as well as my own business and my work with my private clients and my small groups too. So hopefully that gives you some starting place um, to work with. And then here's my email address and my website in case you're interested in more information or in contacting me um, for, you know, in the future. And so that's it. So I may stop my share. And um, Jamie, I think we, we did okay on time here. Yeah. No, that was perfect. Perfect. So thank you so much. This has been fascinating. Um, obviously, at the Conservation Foundation, Nature RX, the, the health benefits of being outdoors is a, a big deal for us and something that we've been looking into a lot. And I love the way you summarized all of that information here and really a, a very jam-packed presentation. So thank you so much. Uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, feel free, put them in the chat, put them in the Q&A. We'd be happy to take those now. Um, but uh, yeah, I as I mentioned, I myself need to get out and get active even more. But one of the things that has helped me has been my dog we adopted a dog in August and she's a cattle dog. And I'll tell you what, if she doesn't get outside and get her exercise on walks with us, she starts getting goofy and bouncing off the walls. 
much like children, <laughs> as I have found. So, um, you know, with my own child, when he was younger, if he didn't get enough exercise in a day, we were going to have problems. And especially if we got him outside and doing things, whether it was going for a family walk or just playing in the backyard, getting him to climb on his playground equipment. Um, and he, he loved going to parks. But if we didn't get him outside, we were going to have problems. He was, he was going to get goofy and he was going to get, you know, difficult at times. And he was a much more easygoing kid when he had been outside and been able to spend some time outside. Yeah, it's fascinating. And I'm not sure how um, much people are attuned to noticing that their own experiences within their families or within their kids without necessarily seeing that research, but similar experience on my end. I have three young kids and they actually get along and are interested <laughs> in playing with each other. So <laughs> versus inside where it's a little more challenged, right? So there's just something magical about being outside and what it is and why, you know, might not necessarily matter unless you're research oriented, but just honoring that it's there and, and using it uh, uh, for the healing potential that it offers, you know, it's, it's incredible. Oh, absolutely. So. Absolutely. And, you know, I remember too, when I was a kid, it was such a big deal for us when teachers would let us go outside for class that day. And it was so rare that it happened, but it was like the highlight of the week if we got a chance to do that. None of us really knew why we didn't have a, a reason for it, but we just all knew it was better to be outside than it was to be inside. And yeah. <laughs> I mean, even, even up to college, like, like I, I, I remember, trying to convince teachers in like junior high and middle school that like, let's have class outside today. And, but that persisted even into college. And mm -hmm. I, I had a philosophy class in particular where the professor would be like, yep, you're right. Let's go outside. And we loved it. And it was just, those were the more memorable classes. I feel like when, when we could be outside getting that fresh air, being connected, and um and also learning so yeah not bound by four walls under artificial light that helps <laughs> exactly. um does anybody want to maybe type in some, some of their own experiences too i don't know if anyone has noticed the qualitative difference in their own exercise you know running on a treadmill versus running outside and if that is actually more enjoyable for you or i'd be interested if you've had the opposite reaction maybe you don't enjoy outside exercise and and why so you might be one of those um, people with a personality you know difference that it just isn't appealing to so i'm curious for those that are still here and if they care to share Well, gardening is one of my favorite outdoor activities too, getting my yard back into shape. And it doesn't feel like exercise, though I definitely feel it the next day. But as you were yeah. talking about in the moment, in the moment, you know, I'm focusing on pulling the weeds and moving them around and, and all of that. And I know I'm getting much more benefit than, than I'm thinking about versus if I were to intentionally set out to exercise. Yeah, Bonnie great. says, since she's retired, she's taken up hiking. I now hike year round. I love it. Oh, nice. Yeah, that's great. And I think you had mentioned what the difference between hiking and, and walking, Jamie. And I think sometimes it just depends on the researcher and who's defining it. I think of it in terms of changes in terrain and incline and that kind of thing too. But that's great, Bonnie. Um, and I find it interesting. This was a conversation we've had at TCF, um, the difference in terminology between hiking and walking. And sometimes for certain groups of people, hiking seems much more challenging. It seems much more daunting um, when it's the same, you know, you call it walking, it's the same thing. So going for a walk, going for a hike, you know, I, I guess in my head, as you mentioned, the terrain maybe is a little bit different, but much of the time, especially in preserves around here, it's the same thing. 
Right. Tomato, tomato. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so I guess briefly, I'll share some of my experience too. During COVID, um, I turned outside to exercise. I have a small home gym um, that I've had set up just being the, the profession that I'm in. Um, I kind of have to uh, as a physical therapist, but I started exercising a lot more outside and taking my kids on bikes, bike um, explorations. And we were biking anywhere from 40 to 50 miles a week. And the other week wow. I was just biking to commute my small child to his daycare and I got to 60 miles. I mean, that's no small thing when you, those little trips add up, um, into big environmental savings and, and things like that. Uh, walkers club. Sorry. I can't see the whole comma. If you want to read that Jamie too, someone just posted. Yeah. Bonnie says the, the group she started pre COVID was called the walkers club because the founders of the group thought hikers club would scare people away. Isn't it funny? Just that, that, that slight <laughs> change in terminology that the, the perception of difference between the two. I completely agree. You know, hiking sounds challenging and daunting and like, oh, I don't know if my knees could take that, but you know, you call it walking and it's the same route, the same speed, the same distance. And people are like, oh yeah, walking, I can walk. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I want to thank you so much, Allison, for being here today. This was great. Um, very inspirational. And I think I need to go out and take my AC for a walk. So um, thank you all for joining us today and hope you all enjoyed it. Uh, we hope to see you back next week again, when we are joined by U.S. Fish and Wildlife to talk about the uh, rich natural history of Northeast Illinois, our endangered and threatened species. And in the meantime, get outside. It's a beautiful day. Hopefully it is where you are. It is down here by me, a gorgeous day outside. And I think I need to get out and enjoy it. So I hope you get a chance to as well. And again, big thank you to Allison for joining us. And we hope to see you all back again next week. Take care, everybody. Goodbye. Bye.